What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. Tonight, we're talking about Devs, Episode 5. This video is going to be full of spoilers, but no spoilers from future episodes, and that includes what's shown on the Next Time On preview. I'm Gil, talking to my tech guy slash brother, Alun. Yo. And without further ado, let's jump into Episode 5 of Devs. This episode had an interesting framing device where Katie was watching the chronovisor. That's what I call the device they use to look into the past, the present, and sometimes the future. So virtually everything we saw in this episode was stuff that Katie was watching on that device. To me, that sort of resulted in a little bit of an uneven episode because we weren't watching a straightforward narrative where we see events unfold in sequence. We're watching a series of disconnected clips, some of which I loved, some I liked, and some I didn't like. But we'll get into all of that. It was also kind of unclear to me why Katie would be watching all of this stuff, especially Lily as a child talking to her father. I think some of it might have been exploring the idea, similar to an NSA agent scrolling through your private conversations, that invasion of privacy, except this is sort of 10 times that because you have Katie invading Lily and others' privacy in the worst way possible. She's watching a moment between a child and her father's dying words. So I think that was some of it, but also it felt a little bit like a cheap way to have an in-story explanation for flashbacks, where it's revealing something about the characters we know, Jamie, Lily, we see a little bit about their past, but there was a question looming over the episode for me as to why would Katie be interested in seeing all this, especially considering up to this point, she seemed to be a pretty closed off, unemotional character. Alon, did you have a similar reaction or did you find it, did, did it fit for you that Katie would be watching all of this? I, I don't feel like they've developed Katie very well thus far. I don't know what to think of her. And even in the show, when we you see that flashback of her in school, she just kind of came across as kind of a jerk there. Right. <laughs> so, and she's aware of the bad deeds that Forrest has been up to. And it's just really hard to know right. whether I'm supposed to like her or not, or even understand her. Right. And the, the, I guess the read that I have on her, where I say she's unemotional, you would say we don't even really know if she's unemotional just because we haven't seen her emote very much. But we also haven't seen her do anything very much. So it could just be that she has a little bit more of a soft spot than we realized. She was clearly emotionally impacted when she watched the scene of Forrest watching his family die. So she's not a total robot. She definitely has some emotions. Um, but moving past that, the other interesting thing, every time they use this device, you and I always look at each other and comment on the fact that the, the device seems to change angles. And I mean, I had the impression that what we were seeing on screen was literally what Katie was seeing. Mm -hmm. So this device is selecting different angles and it's, it's, it's just interesting to me that the device would function that way. Yeah. And you know, in in some shows, I would look at what we're saying as a nitpick, but in a show like this, I'm expecting, I'm expecting them to actually think through every aspect of this mm -hmm. technology. I actually want an understanding of why, like maybe the programmers coded in some facial recognition software to know which angle to to face. You know, to see them talking, right? I don't know. Well, you could, th I it, mean, they are such smart programmers, yeah. they've created the most powerful computer in the world. You can throw an algorithm in there that basically detects what is the clearest way to communicate what is happening. So it selects the right camera angle, and on top of that, it chooses the most visually appealing camera angles, yeah. Have an establishing shot of the city before we show <laughs> Lily, <laughs> it basically just writes out a whole script, right? Um, but I, I also think that a flat screen isn't really the best way to represent these moments in time. It really should be like a VR helmet or something or like that holograms. where you could just stand wherever you want in the room and stare. Right. But anyways, maybe <laughs> anyway, we're getting a we, little too deep into that. Yeah, but. that now you're getting into nitpick territory. <laughs> but putting the framing device itself aside, so this episode jumped around quite a bit. We saw a lot of different things. So we're going to recap it, 
by trying to take all those different clips and sort of group them by character and group them by time period. So let's start out with Jamie and Lily. We see Lily right after last episode. She's in a hospital and she appears to be pretty much drugged out of her mind. She's just lying there. Then we see her in her apartment. We see her with Sergey. We see her with Jamie. And initially, I thought this was her remembering old times. And I thought it was just an interesting effect they were using where they were overlaying different memories on top of each other because we see multiple Lilies. We see Lily with Sergey and Lily with Jamie all in the same room. But I think throughout the course of the episode, we see this multiple times and realize that this is actually a quirk of the device. Now that it's been set to use the many worlds interpretation of reality, I think we're seeing multiple possible realities overlap with each other. I think, did you read it the same way? Yeah, at first I thought the same as you. I thought they were just different memories, but it became clear, especially during the scene with uh, Forrest and his family, yeah. which I love. This is one of my favorite aspects of the episode. Every time they went back, I think they did it three times to this device of having multiple realities layered on top of each other creates a very cool visual effect. Then we see what happened with Kenton and Jamie when Kenton showed up to Jamie's apartment. Basically, he drowns Jamie in his own bathtub, doesn't kill him, but just scares him, and then tells him a story about his old days in the CIA. He saw how China crushed the beginnings of an uprising and now he no longer fears the cascade when things start to go wrong china showed him you can stop that from happening even as it begins to spread and in case we didn't understand that metaphor kenton explains it to us he's the tank jamie is the dissident and jamie appears to get the message now i think they were going for an interesting effect here we started the scene with Jamie already terrified and already basically complying with whatever Kenton wanted. We didn't see any struggle from Jamie, but that didn't work that well for me because it came off as sort of silly. I didn't understand from that scene why Jamie was so terrified and so willing to do whatever Kenton said. I assume that right before the scene, Kenton beat him up or Kenton did something to really scare him. In fact, in the background on the toilet, you see blood over there, mm -hmm. but Jamie has no marks on him. He looks unscathed. So the only thing that can sell to us that Jamie is in this terrified state is his acting in that moment. And it just didn't work on me. It came off as silly. I kept saying, I, I need to see Jamie struggle even for a second, but he just sits there and takes it. Did yeah, yeah. It, uh, totally agree. It, it looked like he was not fighting back at all. And I mean, Kenton, he, he doesn't look like that strong a guy. I mean, I, he's definitely got a little bit of muscle there, but I mean, he, Jamie's this young guy. Right. He should be able to <laughs> put up some fight. At least, I don't know. He just he looks like he's just letting him like dunk his head under right. the water. Now, if I were to read the scene charitably... One thing I could say in, J in Jamie's favor is maybe he's just done the mental calculation of it's not just Kenton in that bathroom. Kenton is a representative of a much larger force. If Amaya decides we're going to go after Jamie, Jamie's finished. So he might just figure, I'm going to comply with whatever Kenton wants. I'm not going to fight back. I'm just going to cross my fingers that he doesn't kill me. If it gets close to that point, maybe then I'll start struggling. And then afterwards, I'll see what I can do. If I were to read the scene charitably. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. If I were in Jamie's position, I would assume there's a likely chance Kenton's going to try to kill me, and I would fight back. Especially after <laughs> we saw that Jamie or that Kenton killed Sergey. Yeah. I wouldn't be... I, I don't think he should be thinking about the pot potential consequences at that point of fighting back. Right. It's it's your life. You here. would think the fight or flight instinct would kick in and you would just fight back. So that scene didn't work <laughs> that great for me. And I think overall, the acting on the show is pretty solid. But I will say there are some weak spots. I think this was one of them. I think the show is at its strongest acting wise when they're trying to sell a big emotion. Lily, when she sees Sergey's body and she freaks out, I think in episode one, 
that was a great moment. Even in this episode, when Forrest sees his family get killed in front of him, and he starts yelling, no, Nick Offerman killed it in that scene. So I think the big emotions they do a really good job with, the quieter moments here, later in the episode, some of the moments between Sergey and Lily, they don't work as well for me. Anyway, moving on from the nitpicking, later in the episode, we see the aftermath of Jamie's run-in with Kenton. We think Jamie got the message from Kenton, but he didn't. He calls his family, comes up with a fake story about the NSA, basically tells his family to go away, go into hiding. Why is he doing this? Because he's not going to go quietly into the night. He <laughs> is going to fight back. He sneaks into the hospital and breaks out Lily. And it seemed... Really easy to do that, <laughs> especially considering the reason Lily was brought to the hospital was reckless endangerment. She's a dangerous person, and it seems like Jamie was able to just open the window, jump in, grab her, and, uh, and jump out. And it's funny because sometimes it feels like this show really takes its time. I mean, take this episode, for instance. Episode four, the plot's moving forward. Here, they took a break to show us these flashbacks, which some degree they move the plot forward, but I think a lot of it, especially the Lily Sergey stuff, was there for a character and emotional development. So sometimes the show takes its time, and sometimes it feels like we gotta get Lily out of the hospital. Let's just come on, let's just get to it. <laughs> Jamie goes in, he takes her out, and it was it was fine. So that's okay. Uh move past that. Um, but I'll say uh I have one more negative thing to say. Then I have a lot. I do have a lot of positive things to say about this episode. But I've been finding myself this episode and the last episode less and less invested in the Lily character. Last episode, it happened because it felt like the power that she is up against Amaya is so much greater than what she is capable of right now that it's no longer an underdog story to me. It's a, she doesn't stand a chance. She's just a pawn in this game she doesn't even know about. All the stuff going on in devs, she doesn't even know about any of that. So I started to feel a little bit of a disconnect to Lily. And then this episode, she's not conscious for most of it. So I'm finding myself losing emotional connection to the show. I'm still very curious and interested to see where it goes. But I will say I'm hoping that next episode, Lily starts to get more agency and I can sort of get invested in her again. There is the Forrest character. I love Forrest, but I, it's hard for me to feel too bad for him when I remember he killed my guy, Sergey in episode <laughs> one. <laughs> so like I said, I'm hoping I get roped back in with the Lily character next episode. Moving on from that. So we see Lily as a child through Katie's eyes on a chronovisor. Lily is playing a game with her father. I believe the game is Go. I thought Othello. Apparently those two games look very similar, but Go is a more popular and much more difficult game. Her father's pretty impressed with her, and I think this is just establishing for us that as a child she was very intelligent in the same way, and she has strategic thinking. To be good at Go, it's a similar sort of skill it takes to be good at chess. You need to be able to see a few moves ahead. So maybe she is uh, playing a long game here. Maybe going to the hospital was all part of a bigger plan. Then we see her in the hospital with her father, and we hear what I believe are her father's dying words, or likely his last words to her, an ancient Greek saying, no man ever steps in the same river twice because it is not the same river, and he is not the same man. I think they wanted to put that quote in this episode because it plants a seed in Lily's mind to think about change. That's what the quote is all about. Everything is constantly changing. The river is changing. You're changing. And to put it into a quote and to make it her father's last words would take the concept of change and I think make it a very important one to Lily which I think is a viewpoint that is opposed to her enemies, Forrest and Katie. They would see change as just part of a deterministic world. So change is just the universe moving through a series of chain reactions that began with the Big Bang. So I think that's why this is not only a character moment for Lily, but it's also putting that idea into the show and just adding to the philosophical conversation around everything we're seeing here. We also see a couple of lovely moments where Lily and Sergey first meet at the coffee shop. 
We see Sergey say, I love you for the first time. Uh, Alon, what did you think of Sergey's uh, technique picking up Lily at the coffee shop? <laughs> well, I guess I can't be too judgmental because it worked. It worked. <laughs> so maybe he knew his, his audience there. <laughs> right. <laughs> see you on Tinder. No. Me neither. I'll see you here. <laughs> I'll try it out in the real world. We'll see how it goes. But I will say I found this to be a pretty heartbreaking moment. Seeing Sergey again and seeing a couple of what were probably the best moments of his life, knowing where he ends up, it was, it was pretty heartbreaking. And then on top of that, you remember that it's not just us as an audience seeing these moments, but freaking Katie is sitting there in her ivory golden box <laughs> watching this the same way Jamie would scroll through his ex-girlfriend's Facebook page. <laughs> Total invasion of privacy. Um, but heartbreaking moments, I thought. We also see Katie meeting Forrest. So Katie is at a college lecture watching her professor discuss the dual slit experiment. Which, by the way, if you're not familiar with that experiment, I would recommend Googling it. On the show, I think they called it dual slit. You're going to want to search double slit experiment. It's super interesting. When I first read about it, it led me down a whole rabbit hole reading books about quantum physics. Super interesting stuff. But on the show, they basically break down the experiment by saying it shows a particle in multiple places at once, a superposition. And when we witness the particle, when we try to observe it, it seems to change the behavior of that particle. Katie's professor posits that this could be that human consciousness is the modifier. The fact that human consciousness is getting involved somehow affects the experiment. Katie flips out. She thinks the experiment does not speak to the nature of the particle necessarily, but more to the nature of the universe, i.e. the many worlds theory, the one that Forrest hates so much. The teacher dismisses it, and Katie storms out of the room, calling all of her classmates a bunch of dweebs. And then we again get that very cool effect where when Katie walks out of the building, we see many Katies, and one of them is approached by Forrest, who says that he knows that she has a reputation for being one of the smartest students there, but her family will not be able to afford her college fees anymore. He wants to pay for them, and he wants to hire her. Cut to a later conversation on those same steps where Forrest asks, you understand what I'm asking? She says, yes. Forrest says, is it madness? Is there a world in which it could work? So I assume that this is all after he explained to her what he wants to accomplish, which I think we know the basics of it. He wants to build an insanely powerful computer that can prove the world is deterministic by making perfect projections of the past and of the future. Now, you and I this whole time have been assuming there's more to it than that. They want to be able to project into the past, into the future, but does he want to do more? Does he want to bring his daughter back somehow? Where do you sit at the moment? Do you still think he's trying to accomplish more than that? Or could that be it? Is it just trying to prove the world is deterministic? Well, it does seem like he might be trying to bring his daughter back considering the experiment they were doing with that, that rat. I thought so too. And then I did a little bit of thinking and I'm actually <laughs> not sure that's the case because remember what we saw with the rat was a flashback. It was on the screen. Katie was watching. Lyndon was there. Uh, and I have more to say about that, but that's probably the most interesting part of the episode. And you've got to save the best for last. So I will just say at the moment, I have a feeling that really is the end of the experiment. They're trying to prove that the world is a deterministic place. And I'm not sure there's more to it than that. We'll get more into that when we talk about the experiment. First, and we're almost there. First, let's talk about Forrest and his daughter. We see a quiet moment between Forrest and Amaya where they're reading together in bed. And I think they showed this to us so we would just have a renewed appreciation for the love between Forrest and his daughter and how great things were. So it underscores the awfulness of what we see next. We see Forrest on his porch. He gets up. 
He sees an SUV containing his wife and daughter driving home. While he's watching them in the SUV, he's on the phone with his wife, just talking about what they're going to have for dinner that night until some idiot (laughs) T-bones them, flips the car over, presumably kills both his wife and daughter. And then an incredible moment for Nick Offerman. He walks towards them and just yells no over and over, completely breaks down. As he's walking towards them, we see the multiple realities effect again. We see that same car go by multiple times, and we see different iterations of what could have happened in that moment. In one case, the SUV hits the car. In another, they miss each other entirely. In one of them, as Nick Offerman Forrest walks further away, in the foreground of the shot, we see the SUV arrive, no problem. Forrest greets his wife and daughter, and... The scene was incredible for a few reasons. One, visually, just looked amazing. Every time they do a car go right by a person, they did the same thing in the last episode where the car almost hits Lily. Perfect. Two, it just shows such trust in the audience that we'll figure out what's happening here. At first, I thought another car just went by and it almost hit Forrest. But I think Alex Garland respects our intelligence to, to understand that we're seeing multiple realities overlaid with each other. Number three, Nick Offerman's acting here, amazing. And then number four, how do you take a scene where a man's family dies in front of him? Such a tragic scene. How do you make it even more tragic? You take every other possible reality where they don't die and you put it in front of Forrest all at the same time. It was just amazing. Never seen a scene like it before. Alun? Did you like the scene? I thought it was awesome. Maybe my favorite scene of the episode. Yeah, favorite scene of the episode and probably in the top two or three of the series so far. Let's talk about Kenton. He has a meeting with Forrest and Katie, and we see one of my favorite Kenton qualities here, his no BS attitude. He tells him straight up, I'm not going to jail. Lily is a liability, and if it comes down to it, I will act in a self-interested manner. And I just want to look for an opportunity in my life to use that sentence. (laughs) I will act in a self-interested manner. (laughs) And Katie says, it's not in your power to kill her. Kenton doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. He says, okay, let me worry about that. Um, So like I said, I love this moment from Kenton. Uh, It's also just funny to see somebody like Kenton, who's not involved in all this crazy quantum stuff, collide with Katie's world, where she's essentially telling him, it's not in your power to kill her, because the tram lines have already dictated that you're not the one to kill her. And uh, she thinks he can interpret all that by saying, it's not in your power. (laughs) (laughs) Well, doesn't he know what they're doing, though? I got to think back to the previous episodes. I have a feeling he has some general idea. I don't know if he knows all the details of it. Well, remember when they were talking, him and Forrest were talking at Forrest's house on his porch? It seemed like he had a good understanding of what was going on. Maybe maybe he just has a top-level understanding. Right. It could be that. Not 100% sure. Hmm. But I'm very curious to see Lily's next move here. We know that she, assuming the tram lines stay accurate, we know that Lily's going to end up in the golden box and supposedly die. The fact that Kenton sees her as a threat tells me that she is going to make some sort of a move, likely with Jamie's help. You and I were... Uh, speculating that maybe Lyndon will get involved, which I would love. But uh, love the no-nonsense Kenton. Curious to see what happens next with Lily. And it was just nice to see Kenton seeing her as a threat because part of my disconnect the last couple of episodes is that I've been seeing her as sort of a powerless character, at least for a couple of episodes. But Kenton clearly doesn't think so. He thinks she's still got something left. And I think so too. Excited to see what it is. So let's talk about the experiment. We saw a few glimpses of this in a previous episode. It might have been last week's episode, I forget. But in the opening, we see Katie's face, Forrest's face, a couple of the other characters, all reflecting a different color. We also see a dead rat lying on a golden surface. So finally, we see what it's all about. We have that golden surface with an interesting pattern etched onto it. We see a few objects, a clock, a rat, a sugar cube, a skull. And 
I'll just say my over, before we go into all the details of what happens here, my overall interpretation of what they were doing is they were trying to create a perfect simulation of the objects on the table. They were essentially a way to calibrate the machine. So for example, you take the sugar cube. I want to create a perfect quantum computer simulation of that sugar cube. And we will zoom in further than any known computer can zoom in to see how perfectly we've recreated it. At a certain point, they perfectly recreate that rat. So they've now calibrated the machine to our reality. And then they say, let's extrapolate. What does that mean? It means we've calibrated with the rat. Well, we don't really care about the rat. We care about the whole world. So when they start to extrapolate, they see more and more of reality. They see Forrest's face. So I don't think they were trying to bring the rat back to life. I think they were trying to use this computer like we've seen to project into the past and project into the future. But in order to do that, you need to make sure that the computer is properly representing our reality. How do you do that? You take an item we understand, like a sugar cube, and recreate it in the computer. See how well you've recreated it. Oh, we did it perfectly. Let's try it on the rat. Oh, we got the rat perfectly. Okay, now let's start to extrapolate. That was how I read that scene. Later in the episode, we see the rat continuing to lie dead on the table, but we see mm -hmm. it moving on the screen. And that's because they've recreated the rat and now they're looking into the rat's past and they're seeing it alive. While Forrest and Katie are watching the rat on screen, Forrest asks Katie, do you think any of the other devs know what we're really doing here? Katie says no, and then she offers up what she thinks we're really doing here. Katie thinks that Forrest is essentially putting himself on trial. He's trying to determine, is the world a deterministic place? If the world has free will, then Forrest messed up. He could have done things differently. He could have saved his daughter. If the world is deterministic, he had no choice. He is free of guilt. It wasn't his fault. So I think Katie is right. I think that this is really Forrest's ultimate goal. It all comes down to him trying to prove whether or not the world is a deterministic place. And it's so important that we're looking at this reality and not some other reality because he needs to know in our reality, could he have made other choices or what happened? That's what had to happen. And then he can move on and not be guilty over this. Because even if she lives in other realities, like I said, he needs to know about this reality. So my current theory is that he's not trying to bring his daughter back. Um, now, in the next episode, if we see that dead rat start to reanimate, <laughs> get up and start running around the room, I'll change my tune. And I doubt we'll get an answer, an in-show answer to whether or not we have free will. I'm assuming this is an idea that Alex Garland really wants to explore. And in the show, even if we do get some sort of an answer, I'm guessing it'll be shrouded in doubt. For example, if we get to the 48-hour mark and Lily survives, there's going to be a question mark of which universe are we seeing? Did she survive in one universe, but she did die in another and there's going to be that big question mark over the show. I'm assuming this is the kind of show that ends with <laughs> us asking a lot of questions. <laughs> so towards the end of the episode, Katie's been channel surfing through the past. She decides to check out the future again, and she sees Lily crawling, lying on the floor, and dying. Except this time, it's not blurry. We get to see it thanks to Lyndon in, in great color and HD. So we find out Lily was not just lying on any floor, but the golden floor, the one that is in this uh, Dev's building. So somehow she's going to get into Dev's. And then Katie watches Jamie break Lily out of the hospital, and Katie smiles. What do you think that smile was all about? <laughs> like, like I said earlier, I don't fully understand Katie's motivations, and if she's morally leaning one way or the other. So, I don't know. I think that she, she, I think, is reassuring herself that the determinism that her and Forrest believe in is in place. It's sort of like, 
Okay, I checked all the tram lines. The device tells me Lily dies in 48 hours. She looks at the device. Lily's still going to die in 48 hours. She's escaping the hospital, which leads to point A to point A to B to C to D, which leads to her dying. So I think it's her just sort of reassuring herself, yep, what I saw before is still the case. So that's, that's my current thought. And on the question of morality, my guess is that Katie would describe herself as amoral, as in morality doesn't exist in a world where we don't have free will. In a previous episode, when she's consoling Forrest after Forrest had to have Sergey killed, Lily talks about how, or Katie talks about how difficult it is to essentially unteach yourself all the morals that have been in your experience as a human your whole life. So I think she would describe herself as someone that's at least attempted to, to disconnect from morality entirely. Now, she still has emotions. We saw her affected by the scene of Forrest and his family. I don't think she can fully disconnect herself from all that. Uh, anyway, overall, I think it was, a, to me, it was a mixed episode. On one hand, I am starting to lose my emotional foothold with the show. I want to see what happens next. I'm curious throughout the episode. But if you go back to episodes one and two, on top of just being curious, I was also... On the edge of my seat for Lily, I care about her as a character and I want to see her survive and persevere. Now that we've seen a couple of episodes where she is sort of powerless, then in this episode she's literally unconsciousness, I'm waiting for her to come back. I'm waiting for her to have more agency and get me more emotionally invested in the show again. I mean, having said that, there are emotion emotional moments that work really well. The forest moment in this episode was incredible. One that I will not forget. Uh, also, I want to see what happens next, right? After last episode, I want to know what happens to Lyndon. I want to know what happens to Lily. And we got a glimpse of that, but we kind of paused and went into flashback mode. A lot of interesting stuff, but there is a part of me that says, ah, I really want to see what happens next. So it was a little bit of a tougher episode. Um, the moments I didn't love, moments I did love. So a little bit of a mixed bag. I think I said it earlier, I think the quieter, the quiet emotional moments don't work as well for me when Sergey and Lily you know, say, I love you for the first time. And I can't tell exactly what the issue is. I don't know if it's the writing, the directing, or it, I know a lot of these are not super experienced actors. So it could be a little bit of uh, all of the above. But for some reason, they don't work that well for me. And in the big emotional moments, Lily seeing her dead boyfriend, Forrest seeing his family killed in front of him, work really well. So so your favorite parts are when people are dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want Alex Scarlet. Just torture me emotionally. Those are the best parts. Um, and But on top of all that, I am still super curious to see what happens in the next three episodes. And I still find the philosophical questions this show is exploring to be super interesting. I, I can't underscore enough how much I love the fact that we have a smart sci-fi show that's wrestling with the ideas of free will versus determinism. It's wrestling with the ideas of invading a person's privacy to a degree we've never seen before. It's wrestling with the idea of the multiple worlds interpretation versus other theories of the nature of our reality. So anytime I say something negative about the show, I just need to underscore, no matter what, I'm so happy this show is on the air. And I am overall big fan of the show. Only three episodes to go, so can't see, can't wait to see where it goes next. If only I had that chronovisor, <laughs> wouldn't have to wait. My prediction is we see Lily die in the golden box. So it's actually possible she'll see her death before she actually dies because she's in oh, there. She true. can see it, which then gives her the ability to avoid it. It reminds me of earlier when Forrest said, what if you see yourself cross your arms? You can, will you be able to prevent that? Right. So we may actually see the are we magicians experiment. Will... That would be very cool. If Lily sees her own death, she has it in her mind, and now she can attempt to avoid it, what will happen? Now, we've seen that in other stories before, where in the attempt to avoid some ultimate fate, 
ultimately they cause the chain reaction, which leads them to that fate. But I trust Alex Garland. He knows we've seen that before. So whatever outcome we see here, I'm assuming it won't be that. It'll be something interesting. But we'll see. Any other final thoughts on the episode? Uh, I want to see more uh, cars swerving by in future episodes. <laughs> Every time they've done it so far, it's been amazing. More swerving cars <laughs> and more Stuart, I think. Oh, yeah. Stuart's still great. <laughs> yeah, and I think I kind of gave my parting thoughts on the episode already. Um, one other just random point. Uh, I noticed in the comments last episode, a lot of people referred to the Lyndon character uh, as a female, they said she or her, and that's because Lyndon is played by an actress, a female actress, Kaylee Spaney. Now, in the show, they referred to the Lyndon character as a he, and I thought that was interesting. And I looked into it a little bit, found an interview with Alex Garland where he explained this. Basically, he wanted Lyndon to be a young male character, but he didn't want to have to deal with a child actor. That comes with a lot of production restrictions, and you're not necessarily guaranteed the best actor. So he hired Kaylee Spaney, gave her a certain look, and has her playing this male character, Lyndon. So I thought that was interesting, and uh, I think some people were confused over the gender of the character, and so Alex Garland cleared it up. Anyway, I think that wraps it up for today's episode. So as always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and of course, Alun, what else do they have to do? Uh, you got to hit the bell icon the bell. so you get notified. notified whenever we make more videos like this one. Exactly. Or the next time we go live, as soon as we can figure out how to get this equipment working and we go live, you're going to want to join the live stream so you can be part of the conversation. You can throw your theories out there and we'll discuss them live. But for now, whatever theories you have, whatever predictions you have, whatever thoughts you have in the episode, leave them in the comments below and we'll get a great discussion going. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next One Take.